know, after months of anticipation, the U.S. government finally released their report on UFOs late Friday. But it didn't answer the question. What are those mysterious flying objects spotted by U.S. military pilots in recent years? to discuss the so-called flying saucers. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. Major Keyhole, as author of the book, Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. My name is John Ramirez and I served in CIA from 1984 to 2009. I had a 25-year career and it culminated in me receiving the Career Intelligence Medal for my service. And I started at CIA in the Directorate of Science and Technology in the Signals Intelligence field with the specialty of Electronic Intelligence and later transferred over to the Directorate of Intelligence where I was a weapons intelligence analyst for Russian ballistic missile defense systems and radars. I got interested in UFOs at a very young age. When I was four years old, I saw through my very first telescope and I saw the wonders in the skies, the moon, the stars, and I just felt like that's where my real home was, that I belonged out there. And this was before the space program, so I wasn't really influenced by Project Mercury and the original seven astronauts of NASA. This was before then that I felt like my destiny, my future, even my past was out in space. My name is Richard Doty. I was a counterintelligence officer for the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigations. I served in that role from 1978 until 1988. During my time as a counterintelligence officer with the Air Force, I conducted investigations into the unidentified flying object phenomena. Before that, of course, I had been briefed into the program. And during my time uh, at Kirtland Air Force Base, I gained access to a special access program, which dealt with the United States government's investigation into the United, uh, UFO and ET phenomena. And during that briefing, I was, I learned about Roswell. The first part of the briefing pertained to how we, the United States government, had made our first contact with an extraterrestrial being and craft, and that was at Roswell, New Mexico. What I was told during this briefing was that two ident uh, unidentified crafts, later identified as extraterrestrial crafts were flying around New Mexico uh, on a mission, some type of reconnaissance mission, we think, and they collided. Now, 
That's a big controversy because uh, if you stop and think of an alien craft coming uh, 40 light years away and they're coming into our atmosphere and they collide, how, do, how can that happen? During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. My name is Tom Carey, and uh, I'm a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Somewhere along the line, after I was uh, graduated from college and spent four years in the Air Force, I became re-interested in the subject of UFOs because I had heard something about a, a uh, incident called the Roswell Incident. And uh, I read the book and it just blew me away. So to become active in the, in the field, I joined MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, just to receive their monthly journal that they print. Well, the next thing I know, I'm the state section director for Southeastern Pennsylvania in charge of investigating local UFO cases. I wound up investigating local cases in the, in the Philadelphia area, five county area. And I learned that there, there were these two fellas uh, Kevin Randall and Donald Schmidt were reopening the Roswell case, which had sort of lain dormant for, uh, well, initially 30 years. It was a two-day story back in 1947. It was a flying saucer? No, it was a weather balloon. It was a two-day story. And uh, these two fellas, Randall and Schmidt, were reopening the Roswell case. And part of that story was that the crash was discovered by a group of archaeologists from the University of Pennsylvania. Well, I have a degree in anthropology. I'm a trained physical anthropologist. I went for a doctorate in physical anthropology. That's how I became a quote-unquote active investigator on the case, because this is like 1991 now. So I joined the Randall and Schmidt team looking for the archaeologists. And uh, since then, I've expanded my interest in the case and became an investigator. Now, 31 years on this one case, the Roswell case, and we have found over 600 witnesses, uh, first and second hand on the case. Now, during our investigation, we learned many things. Uh, certainly, uh, some things about the government involvement in suppressing this case. I was hired into the Directorate of Science and Technology as what is known an ELINT analyst or electronic intelligence analyst. My job was to analyze the Russian ballistic missile defense system and its radars associated with that system. That job then entailed looking at the targets that the Russians were interested in. And so through that avenue, I was able to understand the workings of the Russian radars designed to look for ballistic missile launches, designed to look for satellites. In the course of my work at CIA in that field, there was a time when the Russians were very interested in targets that were not ballistic missiles and not satellites. They eliminated these two targets, especially the ballistic missiles, there was no surprise attack. However, because they detected objects that were unusual, they went into a high state of readiness. Their strategic rocket forces went into a state of readiness, which we then detected and was of a concern to us. They did stand down and they did their own analysis of what happened. And we did our analysis of what the Russians detected. And it appeared that there were objects of interest to the Russians that warranted a high state of readiness on their part. So I wrote a memorandum 
for the then Deputy Secretary of Defense, John Deutsch, about these radar systems going into a high state of readiness because of objects that they tracked and described that they were not satellites and they were not, of course, ballistic missiles, but it could have been uh, a test of the system. It could have been a training uh, segment for their personnel running these radar systems. These are like plausible kind of explanations. But later I learned that what they detected were these orbs or objects that were flying over Russian airspace from the Arctic Circle. And so to understand these, these radar systems are in the periphery of Russia looking for threatening targets. And when they find a satellite system and it matches up to a known satellite, they'll drop the target and keep continuing to scan the horizon. Well, in this instance, what popped up over the horizon flew very fast and under intelligent control with intent to go to a destination. And it was not aircraft. It was not any kind of missile test. This prompted the Russians to investigate this even further. My name is Jesse Peake. I'm a MUFON field investigator in the state of Pennsylvania, city of Philadelphia, section one. Um, MUFON is a, a big or worldwide organization that investigates the UFO phenomenon to scientifically help humanity. Uh, we've been doing this since 1967 and we have MUFON field investigators worldwide, not just here in the United States. Um, and we break down um, all kinds of different investigations that are done and reported to us, U UFO sightings, experiencer reports, um, abduction reports. I also work with the ERT team which is the experience or resource team for MUFON. So if you've had an experience, you can report that, fill out a questionnaire, and we'll actually help you and walk you through in trying to find answers to what you had in your experience. So I joined MUFON in 2019, and a big part of where that field investigator um, feeling inside me comes from, I was actually in the Army National Guard, so I'm very familiar with chain of command. I was a 13 Bravo artillery cannon crew member. I did my time at Oklahoma, Fort Sill. Um, and I was stationed in the Pennsylvania National Guard branch on Southampton Road. Um, so I'm very familiar uh, with signing NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, uh, working with the chain of command like we do in MUFON. Uh, we know that, you know, it's only need to know sort of situations where if you, you know, you don't ask unless you're <laughs> offered to know. Um, I've worked with plenty of people in the intelligence field and people that have worked in the DOD, um, the DIA, uh, working with them probably on a weekly basis throughout MUFON, I met a lot of people that way. I mean, we, we know that the government can keep secrets in the, this intelligence field. We look back at the Manhattan Project, and that was 130,000 people that worked on that project. Two billion dollars of U.S. money went to that project, and not one of those people leaked that project whatsoever. So we know that the intelligence community can keep a secret. We, they've been doing it since Roswell. I mean, 75 years, 75 plus years of keeping secrets of this UFO phenomenon. And just now recently, we're starting to have people in, the con in Congress, senators, that are starting to make new amendments, the Gilbrand Rubio Amendment, um, that's been coming out. Another, uh, Chris Carson, another senator, they're all fighting for disclosure to come forward to give us this information finally. And usually NASA falls in line with that, with the government and not telling these secrets like this. But now Bill Nelson, has been coming out and his scientists have been pushing the intelligence community to give them that information so we can actually scientifically look at this the proper way. The intelligence community knows what they're doing. Um, they are slowly getting little leaks here, but can we trust those leaks? People come out of the woodwork saying, yeah, I'm ex-intelligence, I used to do this and that, work at the Pentagon. Um, even people that say they work with NASA back in the day, they come out and they start disclosing, disclosing a little bit of information here and there but their job was trained to be an intelligence officer, so they're the best liars trained in the world. And I know this from being in the military myself. 
um, if we had to say what we had to say and because it was going to be on the books or in a video somewhere of course we had to be the ones to go along with it and say what had to be said whether it was the truth or not um, I've seen people do that all the time it, I mean it happens it happens every day especially in Congress and you see people talking about it stuff in the Pentagon during that time frame that the craft the Roswell incident happened in, in July of 1947 we had a a uh, very serious lightning storm in New Mexico, in the central part of New Mexico. And anybody that's been in New Mexico knows that lightning storms can be vicious. Now, these two crafts were flying in the central part of New Mexico and they collided. One landed or crashed near Corona, New Mexico. The other craft crashed west of Socorro near Horse Mesa. The craft that, that, that landed near Corona, New Mexico, was discovered by an archaeological team uh, a, few, a few hours after the craft crashed. Now, we talk about the debris field that was found by on the Brazel Ranch. That debris field was part of the craft that crashed in Corona. It was the ant antenna. Uh, section of that craft. But the actual craft was recovered pretty much intact by the, the Army Air Force. Now remember during that time period, 1947, the United States Air Force didn't exist. That didn't come into play until, 1940, until September of 1947. But the Army Air Force was responsible for collecting the debris and, and, the, and the bodies. The bodies were taken initially to uh, Roswell Army Airfield and then on to Los Alamos. One live ET was found in the crash at Corona. Uh, he was given the identification of EBA or extraterrestrial biological entity and he stayed alive from 1947 to 1952 when he died in our captivity. The second craft crashed out near Horse Mesa but that craft wasn't found until 1949. A rancher moving his cattle from a lower uh, grazing range to a higher grazing range discovered that craft in, in, uh, in uh, late fall of 1949. Now, this area of western New Mexico in Catron County is extremely remote. Uh, the only people that would frequent that area would be ranchers, and this rancher uh, went up there to move his cattle and discovered the craft. He had no idea what this craft was. Uh, he eventually uh, contacted the Catron County Sheriff's uh, some days later, because it took him some days to get away. It took about five days for the sheriff to make it out there to look at the craft and figured it was something that he couldn't identify. Immediately they notified the Air Force at Kirtland, at Kirtland Field. They came out, recovered a crash, Unfortunately, all the, the uh, occupants of the craft at Horse Mesa were dead. Their bodies were deteriorated. So that's, in essence, the basics of the Roswell craft, crash sites uh, that I was told by the United States government. Now, I have no reason to think that what I was told during that time is not true. I think everything that, that I just stated is factual uh, by the United States government's knowledge. So the headline goes out on July the 8th, 1947, that the Roswell Army Airfield uh, had recovered a flying saucer. Well, somewhere along the line, the government did not like that and very quickly they changed the story to kill it in the press that it wasn't a spaceship but a weather balloon. Now they would have been better off if they said well it was a high one of our high-tech latest fighter jets that had crashed but they said it was a weather balloon and so they suppressed the story in uh, the newspaper. So they took care of the press now, what about the, uh, the airmen at Roswell? They knew, I mean, the story went around like a wildfire. and Everybody on the base knew what happened. So they, they threatened the airmen 
will be holding these meetings in their hangars. Okay, fellas, you want to know more about uh, what you think happened uh, around here? Okay, if you want to read more about it, you can read about it in Leavenworth Prison. So they threatened the, the airmen to keep quiet or else they'd, be, they'd wind up in Leavenworth. Now what about the civilians? What about the civilians that had gotten to the crash site before the military? And we know that they did. They had uh, threatened, and now there was no martial law. They did not declare martial law. There was no emergency, uh, like a you know invasion or anything like that, to where the military could take over the town. But they de facto did take over the town, and they started threatening the witnesses that who knew what had happened, had been to the site, had seen the crash, and especially had seen the little bodies. They threatened the civilian population, and there were a lot of them. Uh, with death. They said, if you talk about this, we're not only going to kill you, we're going to kill your whole family. My name is Eric Mintel. I am the founder of Bucks County Paranormal Investigations. Also, Eric Mintel Investigates. And uh, for years, there's always been so many great stories of ghosts, UFOs, everything paranormal here in Bucks County and beyond. And uh, I briefly joined uh, MUFON back in, I think, 2009, uh, when we had a huge UFO flap here in Bucks County in 2008. Uh, with many, many, I mean thousands of people uh, were seeing these objects and a lot of video evidence and whatnot. So um, I became a field investigator for a short period of time. Going back to Roswell, 1947, and you know, the, the, the government's uh, you know, admission that they caught, they found a disc that day on, in, in the field and, um, and then right away covered it up. So I think probably the government at that time didn't want to cause panic because look, we had the Cold War. The Cold War was happening, and then that just proliferated, you know, at, you know, decade after decade. But what people don't understand is that the sightings were still going on; they were still happening. You now, so maybe you didn't hear a, a lot of what was going on at that point. But when you've got UFOs flying over Washington D.C. over the Capitol building in 1952. You can't deny that. That's there. And they had no idea what it was. Uh, you know, Project Blue Book did the studies of, of the UFO reports. And I think they had like um, 17,000 reports and I think 709 that couldn't be explained. So, and probably a lot more than that. So, you know, I think the, the bottom line is, and even with these Tic Tac UFOs, they don't know what it is. Is it causing a threat? We haven't seen any of that. We haven't seen that. I mean, I don't know. Some reports use, I mean, <laughs> you get some of the reports of people that have been, you know, burned by, you know, the radiation of it, or they've had some kind of like close contact that way. But as far as physically, you know, or destructively doing something with, with these UFO reports, I don't think they're, they're threatening. I don't think they're a threatening thing. I, my opinion is that they're here to monitor us. They're monitoring us for some Thing. We don't know what that is. So what is the phenomena? That's the biggest question that we've all been asking for, for millennia, really. I mean, if you go back to religious times, they're there. There's a painting of the Madonna holding Jesus with a guy in the background looking at a UFO in the background. It, it, so it's amazing that these things are there. They are in plain sight of what we're, what we're seeing. They're there every day. The, my, my feeling is the government just does not know what these are and uh, they don't know how to approach it. So that's why they created ATIP. That's why they're creating all of these different infrastructures to deal with this somehow. But so far, nobody has an answer. So I'm working on a case now, going back to the, the, the problems people have after having been abducted or, or with a UFO sighting. And I was sent a picture and she showed me some puncture wounds that were left behind on her body after having an experience. Now, we see these a lot with abduction, abductees and experiencers. They get marks on their bodies. Some even will get implants. Dr. Roger Lear was a big, big part of that. He, he helped 
get these and people with implants that have had experiences and he would remove them and we have a lot of data on those as well um, a lot of the times you, if you have an object in your body you can pull it out and then it'll have a membrane around the object itself and what that membrane does is it helps the body not reject the object being placed inside then when you cut that off it usually turns down to some type of metal or meteorite that's being placed in the body now there's been plenty of times where we've actually taken an EMF reader or some kind of electrical uh, device and put it close to the objects that are that are implanted in people and it will actually give off readings um, which is I mean what does that we have no idea um, this is just part of the phenomenon that we question in 1984 I was assigned to uh, area 51 we, you the public would call it area 51 it was groom Lake complex in Nevada I walked into a building and there was a closed circuit uh, camera, a uh, monitor, excuse me, show, uh, uh, showing a picture of an ET on the, on the camera. I asked the agent in the room, where is this? What, what am I looking at here? He said, this is closed circuit. Uh, this ET is at another facility. And we, I learned later it was S2 Annex, it was called. And uh, he's getting ready to be interviewed. And I watched it for about, like I said, about seven to 10 minutes and another officer came in the room and asked me what I was doing in there. And I said, oh, I came over for another project and I see this, he said, I don't think you're cleared for it. So I had to leave, but in that seven to 10 minutes, I saw a lot uh, of this. Now, the ironic part of this was there were two intelligence officers sitting, one on one side of him, one on the other side of him. And he, there was no, there was sound in the room, but there was no word spoken. Everything was being done, I think, by, we would refer to as telepathy, but actually the government doesn't consider it that. They, they're calling it thought transfers. People think that we gather together in dark rooms and talk about UFOs. So we don't do that at all. Um, at CIA, there are no UFO accounts. There are no ET accounts, intelligence accounts that I was aware of when I served there. Because of our day-to-day -day jobs, of what we did with our regular analysis, we detected Russian interest in the phenomenon. And so we do have some sensors that can detect IR. That's no longer classified. That is something that you can search for yourself in FOIA documents that certain classes of our surveillance satellites have IR capabilities. They are electro-optical satellites. And with these sensors, we also detected orbs as well, flying over Russian airspace. And so you might wonder, why not U.S. airspace? Well, keep in mind that the U.S. intelligence community does not conduct surveillance. We do not spy over U.S. territory. We are a foreign intelligence focused agency. So that is why we detected it over Russia. And so that brought us to thinking, well, what are these craft? They're flying extremely fast. They're flying extremely high. What could it be? Could it be a threat? So my branch, the Elan Analysis Branch, was assigned to eliminate, to rule out what it could be. We looked at several Russian craft, aircraft that they had, which could fit the bill. Uh, there's the MiG-29 and there's the MiG-31. These two are interceptors. They're designed to fly straight up into the sky and then shoot down something below them. So we eliminated those MiG-29s and MiG-31s. They carried something called a stealth generator. The stealth generator could have created something like an orb-like uh, appearance to an IR sensor, but these craft were flying much higher than the 123,000 foot world record altitude set by the MiG-31, for example. So we eliminated that. Subject matter experts were then called together at each of these agencies by the agency that detected the presence of these orbs in our sensors. 
That agency was the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So what they did was they eliminated um, the fact that they were Russian aircraft. And so they went to the NRO and tried to then find out if there was any kind of glitches in the satellite. NRO, who's responsible for the care and feeding of these satellites, came with the report, no, there was nothing wrong with the satellites. Uh, NGA also eliminated any of the ground software that may have been processing these images, and no, there are no glitches in the software. And so the NGA and NRO would need to get together and discover exactly what are these objects in the frames of electro-optical imagery that they've detected. They gather together these subject matter experts in these other agencies like CIA, like DIA, like NSA, NRO, NGA, as well as their uh, contractors, to do a deep dive into exactly what these objects might be. And this was the ORB working group. And so a report from a Russian general at the time, retired now, his name was Alexeyev, General Alexeyev wrote that the Russian leadership wanted to attract these objects using radars, and they found a way to do so. In 2016, my girlfriend and I were uh, traveling across the Center Bridge Bridge in, from uh, New Hope to Stockton, New Jersey. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw five orange orbs. And so these lights just came out of nowhere. And at first I was trying to see, well, there's a restaurant right there. Could these possibly be Chinese lanterns? Maybe there's a wedding going on or something like that. And I'm like, well, wait a minute, no, it's February and it's cold out and there's no way there's gonna be any kind of thing like that. So with that, I'm fumbling to get my phone to try to take a picture of it. And of course my flash goes off of the phone and you know, but I was able to get one shot, but she got a better look at what was going on. And these things just appeared. There was five lights, they appeared and they, it looked like they did a search pattern over the river. And then one by one, they just petered out one by one and disappeared. And I was able to get the last one before it, before it went away. One of the most incredible nights. I could not believe that we actually saw something like that. Some people get, go real deep into the rabbit hole, you know, as we call it. Um, and things tend to happen because you get so frustrated and you're thinking you're working with the right people that come out and try to leak you little stuff. But really, they're most of the time leaking disinformation. Um, and that tends to hurt that person, get them confused, and they think they're losing their mind. And, and we've, had, we've seen this before. Um, we've seen people lose really tight-knit relationships with their wives, married for 20, 30 years, um, over them coming out and stating they've seen a UFO, just doing that. Um, and you don't see too many very doctors or scientists coming out themselves talking about this subject either. Um, it's, or pilots. I mean, pilots are one of the biggest you know, witnesses that we have today that come out. Um, and the FAA tells them, you know, report it, send it to us, and it goes in a lockbox. And usually some people will even show up and take the evidence. They'll take, the, there's a little box that goes in every little plane that records the radar systems, just like in the military. And what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll take those boxes and then make them sign an, an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, saying that they can never talk about this stuff again, which deters people from reporting a UFO sighting. And that hurts the community in a whole because these people are some of the top trained, most have military backgrounds, which is why they got into flying planes like they have. So they know what they're seeing. They're some of the most credible witnesses we have in the, in the UFO field. And this is what they're being, this is what's being done to them. They're being deterred not to say what they're seeing. Big picture. Does the Pentagon know more than they're saying? 100%, 100%. And Leland, you had George Will on earlier. He said it's in, a, in our country's DNA not to trust the government. And this is another example why. These are Navy pilots. These are the top pilots in the world. investigated other sightings and incidents that involved UFOs or ETs 
during my time uh, from 19, uh, 1978 to 1988. Uh, in 1984, I was assigned to uh, Area 51. We, you, the public would call it Area 51. It was Groom Lake Complex in Nevada. It was actually a Detachment 3 Air Force Test and Evaluation Site, which was the, the headquarters for that, was out of Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, and out there, while I was there, I also had access to information pertaining to the UFOs, uh, ET contacts that we had, and actually live live ETs that we had out there. Now, I didn't have access to everything pertaining to that program. Special access programs are very compartmented in the, in the military and the government. So you only have access to parts of, of the program, not all of it. But uh, I had, uh, I was a counterintelligence officer for the base. And so I had to have access to enough in order to do my job. And one of the jobs of a counterintelligence officer is what the general public refers to as disinformation. Uh, we, United States government, especially the counterintelligence officers, are trying to protect the secrecy of, of what we're doing in uh, research and development projects, reverse engineering of a, of a craft, or uh, developing some kind of special weapons from the craft or some other technology. So during our protection of these high level, uh, cl highly classified projects, what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop a program to protect it from the general public. So for instance, if you're driving along some, some place close to a test range, such as we'll say uh, uh, Highway 95, or Highway 93 in Nevada, and you see something flying out there uh, that is exotic to you or not known to you, you're gonna immediately think it's either something developed, uh, highly classified object that we developed, or it might be an extraterrestrial craft. So depending on which way the pendulum swings, so to speak, we'll try to convince you one or the other that what you saw is, is actually a UFO to protect the real project that we're working on, which is maybe a reverse engineering. It would be one of our crafts, but we're trying to convince you it was an ET. Now, it also works the other way around. You see something, we try to convince you when you actually see a UFO, and we know it's a UFO, we know it's an extraterrestrial craft, we're gonna try to convince you that it's one of ours. It's something we're developing, so you don't have to say something about it. Or, hey, be a patriotic American and, and just be quiet about what you saw. Don't, 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 don't spread it around. You know, we have a lot of uh, uh, hope now about disclosure, right? You've heard about the term disclosure. The government has created a, what they call a, uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force. Well, what that is going to turn out to be, I guarantee you, is to keep the cover-up going. And they, if they release information, they're supposed to periodically release such information. They're, they're housed in the Defense Department. Periodically, they're supposed to report on findings of, they don't call them the UFOs anymore, they call them UAPs unidentified aerial phenomenon. If they do bring up the subject of UFOs or UAPs uh, in any context, I guarantee you they will never talk about Roswell for two reasons, two reasons. One, it will prove that they have been lying to us for 75 years as we speak. And two, that they committed civil rights violations to cover up the case. They will not talk about Roswell. They have not talked about Roswell since 1997, and they put out a, uh, a monograph a book called Roswell Case Closed. They hoped it was case closed, but it's still open as far as the civilian investigation, myself and uh, Donald Schmidt, uh, is concerned. When Bill Clinton took office, he realized immediately when he took office that there was a government within a government. 
So there's there's a lot of deep deeper things here going on uh, under the surface than than what we're what we're seeing. Um, and again, all of those guys. It's great that they're uh, Lou Elizondo and all those guys are bringing this to the forefront and getting this information. But again, what's happening? Are we getting any answers? I don't think so. I mean, it's there. I think almost it's it's be, people are becoming desensitized to it as well because it's just a proliferation of these sightings that, oh, there's another UFO sighting. There it is again. You know, until something lands on the White House lawn, <laughs> like it did in the day the Earth stood still, I think it's going to be just that. It's going to be an enigma. It's going to be ubiquitous. It's going to be there all the time. And that's what we do. That's what, But we're searching for that answer all the time on what it could be. And that that is the greatest mystery. What could it be? What is it? Um, and I go back to another case, which I, I love, and I love to, uh, to research this, was the, uh, in the 50s, the Holloman Air Force Base UFO landing. And uh, apparently a UFO had landed. On, a crew was doing uh, maneuvers, and they were filming uh, the maneuvers, and they had seen three objects coming over the, over the landing, over the base. And one seemed to be, it was wobbly. It was kind of like in trouble. Well, it came down and landed, and they filmed everything. They filmed this thing coming out, and just out of close encounters, this thing landed, the tripod came out, the door opened up, three of these beings came out. Now, the description of these guys was what made me think that this could be a real event because they weren't the typical greys. These guys had big noses. They had weird, like an African wrap, something like a, they said it was a communication device on their head weird their eyes were like ours but they looked like egyptian like eyes but the pupils went like a cat's they were up and down so and they had like uh, blue fitting jumpsuits on and so it was just the most interesting description of an extraterrestrial that you'd never heard about you've never heard about this but supposedly they had film footage of this well what happened was there was a film crew, when Nixon took office, he was going to disclose all of the UFO information. He was gonna get it out to the public and say, look, this is what's going on. We do know that they're real. He was gonna put, he put a, uh, a documentary film crew together and they were gonna to put uh, together a video called UFOs Past, Present, and Future. They uh, hired uh, Robert Emenegger, who was a director, and he was told he could get 600 feet of this footage of this UFO that landed that they could put into the documentary. Well, when it came time to go get the footage, it mysteriously disappeared. Um, but apparently about 12, 13 seconds of it made it into the documentary. Somehow it made it into the documentary. And you could see this white dot just coming down to the, to the, uh, to the tarmac. You know, was, were they trying to get that out there? Were they trying to say then? This really happened. Well, let's put it in a way that we, we're not going to say that it truly happened, but it could have happened. It's all of these different things that we've got to, you know, kind of like go through all these different layers of, you know, I don't, I don't want to say lies, but yeah, lies, deception, um, you know, kind of um, manufacturing the truth. Um, and that's been the greatest mystery is like, what is the answer? Everything the government does has a plan. You can't really do much in the government without some sort of an operational plan. So when we uh, try to protect a technology, research and development project, an exotic weapon system, uh, we plan it. Uh, most of the planning is done at headquarters, and then it's felt, uh, filtered down to the counterintelligence officer at the base level, and we implement that program that is set down to us. That was my role as counterintelligence officer. Now there's, there's numerous projects and special access programs I worked on uh, that are still classified. Uh, I'm not gonna hide the fact that we, United States government, knows about extraterrestrial races, about exotic technology that had been given to us by uh, ETs, the fact that our planet has been visited by ETs for probably thousands of years, now remember I mentioned that we had an ET in captivity from 1947 to 1952, uh, was, was codenamed EVA for Extraterrestrial Biological Entity. 
he was able to communicate eventually with us. Now, you, you, you have to understand that an ET is not familiar with our technology, our science, our time, nothing about our society. So it was very difficult for us to obtain information from him. From, it was a male initially. Uh, Eva was willing to provide the information, but the communications process was very slow during that time period. Number one, he couldn't speak English, obviously, and we couldn't speak his language. And his bio biology uh, and anatomy was highly different from, from a human. So our scientists, our doctors, our, 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 our very, very uh, smart physicians developed a, a, an implant to put in, into his neck, which allowed him to, to say our words. Before that, he couldn't uh, uh, pronounce any of our words because of the way his vocal cords or his uh, anatomy uh, existed in his, in, his, in his throat. But we developed a way to do it. Uh, very smart, Eva was very smart, extremely intelligent. And he was able to learn, number one, our math, really easy, our language, at least not all of it, but, but enough to communicate with us, and enough to relate to us some of the things that he could that was somewhat similar on his planet to our planet. An officer in the office of the chief scientist and the director of science and technology approached me. So this is someone I knew that I worked with before in a field called scientific visualization. And he said, there's going to be an interesting one day symposium that you might want to attend. It's going to be at this hotel and it's going to be on this date. There were three topics on the agenda. It was sponsored by an office at CIA which was highly placed and we should have known these topics. These topics were the UFO studies done by CIA in the past, the existence of alien hybrids and CIA's interest in alien hybridization of the human genome, and the third topic was about an information technology explosion that will happen where this information will be disseminated very rapidly uh, with devices that were not yet invented, far better than any of the cell phones we had back in the day. This was the first time where I actually got an official briefing on anything to do with UFOs. And in the briefing, it was stated that the McMinnville, Oregon UFO was an actual UFO. The briefer said, a lot of the UFOs seen during the 50s and 60s when CIA was testing its aircraft, that is the U-2 and the A-12 ox cart, they were identified as UFOs by observers on the ground because the test craft were silver. They were not black. They were not black planes at all during the testing phase. They were silver. So when you see something streaking across the sky, at 70,000 or 80,000 feet, that was silver. A lot of observers thought that they were UFOs. And CIA thought back then that, okay, that's fine. Um, if they identify them as UFOs, um, that's just hiding in plain sight, these special aircraft that we were working on. We don't care if they identify it as UFOs. And so the McVinville UFO was a real UFO. That occurred in 1950 before the first U-2 flew. Speaking about the uh, government report that they put out 
uh, I believe it was June 25th of last year. That report, unfortunately, did not was not historical in nature. They only covered cases since 2014, namely the these uh, gun videos of the uh, Navy. It did not uh, have any Air Force cases, and uh, they, it was only limited to 114 cases that they looked at. They couldn't explain 113 of them, were still unexplainable. The one that they could explain turned out to be a weather balloon, of all things. So the other thing about this, this uh, whole phenomenon since 2017 is that the Air Force has said nothing. It's all been a Navy show. And this UAP task force that they're putting together uh, is, is a Navy CIA thing. The Air Force is not mentioned at all. And that's where all the cases are. The historical cases, Roswell, uh, Rendlesham Forest, uh, other good ones, they didn't even look at those because they would have to admit too much suppression, too many uh, laws that they broke to suppress those, especially Roswell. The Air Force has not spoken since 1997, which was the 50th anniversary of the Roswell case. So all the way back when Roswell first occurred, the newspapers put a headline out and stating the truth of what actually occurred. The rancher came forward being a good citizen, thinking he was doing the right thing. But immediately the day after, actually within the same 24 hours, the, the narrative was changed. And um, this guy was made to sign this non-disclosure agreement. He was in holding, held for six days, almost a whole week, being tortured and talked to in ways to not describe what happened on his ranch. When he was released, we know he was paid money. He showed up in a brand new truck a couple weeks later, and he never spoke about it again. Now, there's a lot of people, and he wishes he never went back and told anybody about what happened. He says this to this day, well, until he passed away. But now, who is to blame for this? Who are we going to go after? Who, should they be paid for their losses and what they've, the, everything that they've went through and lost? It might not happen because these people are so into the black market and so deep into the government that we can't even get FOIA requests out because they're in private industries doing this work. So it's hard to find who is really responsible for this. Does the president know about this? I don't believe so because he's only, he only does a four-year term. He gets done again. It's a full eight years. So would they really debrief him on, on all this? I don't really think so. Um, so I think it goes way deeper than the president, and I believe it goes into the CIA and little private industries like this where they can do this work and not have to answer for it because this happens every t all the time with every kind of thing, not even the UFO phenomenon they do this with. Even if they do disclose everything, I don't think everybody will be given the respect that they deserve back because it is so deep like this. Um, people have gone down this rabbit hole many times and uh, they come out on the dark side in, in, in all this because they know that they'll never win. And it's a shame because it shouldn't be like that. We live in a free world where you know it's free speech, we're allowed to vote, we should be able to know we pay these people in Congress and our government to work for us, to speak for us, to do things to help this country move forward. Yet we're stumped when we get this uh, intelligence thing going on where they want to hide everything all the time. I don't think we'll ever fully get a full disclosure from the government, in my opinion. I just think that if they did that, it would, it would ruin religion. It would ruin the government and the oil products that we get from overseas. And that's what the government does. They hide stuff. If it, was, if it was a religion aspect, people would not know what to believe in anymore. They believed all their lives are about a Christian, Catholic, you know, whatever it is. Um, and then you come down to hearing that there's aliens and other life out there. I mean, that can ruin a person. But see, if the government came out long ago and disclosed this like they should have, we wouldn't have these problems or these issues today. Based on what he could eventually explain to us and what we could teach him, uh, we found that he's been visiting Earth, or his species been visiting Earth, or our solar system, I should say, for about 2,000 years. So that, of course, brings up the the big question that people ask is, wow, was he here around the time Jesus was here? Now, that's, that's a uh, very uh, touchy 
conversational piece to talk to the general public, especially somebody who's religious. If they think that ET planted a being on Earth 2,000 years ago, immediately they're going to think it, it was Jesus. And was Jesus uh, preaching not the gospel, so to speak, but their gospel or their, their belief? One thing we did find, which is astonishing, was that although uh, Eba didn't talk about a god, he talked about a supreme being. And they did worship a supreme being, similar to the way we uh, uh, worship God or uh, 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 Muhammad or uh, uh, other religions. He showed us something in, a, in the craft that related, it was a, a figurine that they would worship similar to what we would worship a, 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 a sculpture or something of God or Jesus. And there's other things that he was uh, uh, able to explain to us that we found in their craft. Now, you understand that their technology was probably 50,000 years ahead of us. So we couldn't understand their technology. Uh, it was difficult sometimes for him to understand our technology. Different planet, different species. Uh, and so we taught him what we could from our uh, uh, civilization, and he taught us what he could from, from his. I mean, you know, th going back to, you know, the Mercury Theater in the air, and what was that? That was the uh, Orson Welles adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. So War of the Worlds, what was that supposed to be? Well, all of a sudden, aliens landed, Martians landed on in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. And you know, what was stated in the newspapers and what actually happened were two different things. Um, you know, the, they were supposedly, you know, there was mass panic. There was people that were like going crazy and there was just mass bedlam everywhere. Well, that never happened. It never happened. But news made it happen. It was fake news back then. And as a matter of fact, Frank Stanton who basically he was the i think the president of, of princeton new jersey and this was the mercury theater of the air and that adaptation was funded by the rockefeller foundation and what happened was frank stanton uh, was upset that they weren't causing the panic that they were hoping to cause um it, you know through that even though every half hour the 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 radio would come on and say this is an adaptation of hg wells war of the worlds um, but it was, uh, but the, what the news stated at that time that there was like mass bedlam happening and, and craziness. But uh, it's just amazing to me how you can have uh, two different, you know, opinions of, of an event that took place and, uh, and one that really happened and one that really didn't happen. You know, this could be, you know, it's manufactured news at that point. You know, it could be manufactured. Uh, to suit the needs of a certain few um, and uh, keep everybody on their toes. Because again, what did we have going on around that time? World War II. Uh, so I always think about that and, and think to myself, wow, you know, it's like there's two, there were two very different things going on. And, uh, and we're just finding out what the real story is today. And if it was just the craft, I think the government would readily disclose that. And yes, there were outer space beings on the craft. I think the government would disclose that eventually. But the fact that these beings had DNA that was found in the human genome, I think that is the actual secret of Roswell. I think that is a core secret of why the government will not talk about Roswell. All humans are, in fact, alien DNA enhanced, but others were more enhanced than most humans, and that these more enhanced humans were of particular interest to CIA. Now, I didn't put it all together back then, but now I believe that, that this is part of the Roswell story that was never told, that whatever craft was recovered, and that whoever the occupants were in that craft, that when the scientists were able to sequence the human genome and then went back at CIA to look at 
the genome of any recovered alien beings, they were surprised to find that what the alien DNA looked like was also in humans. But this was the way I connected the dots because I wanted to understand exactly what Roswell was all about. Why is it such a secret that a spacecraft from outer space crashed and there may have been occupants on board? Why is that such a military secret? Of course you can say it was the Cold War, but the Cold War has been over since 1991 when the Soviet Union fell and still there's this secrecy over Roswell, that particular incident that the government has never addressed. So we, the United States government, knew of some, some instances where we had uh, captured a hybrid. We took him into captivity, so to speak, because we knew that this person was a hybrid. It was a male. He had been bred in a, in a tube at a facility that we later found out about. Examining this person, both uh, physiologically and, and biologically, taking blood samples and, and tissue samples, it, our scientists come, came to the conclusion that this person was in fact a hybrid. The Roswell crash, uh, uh, according to our investigation of over 30 years, contained five crew members or extraterrestrial biological entities as they like to be called. Four of them expired when the ship blew up on July the 2nd, 1947, we believe. One survived the crash and lived for a no number of years post crash. We don't know exactly when it died, but the information we have is that it expired during some experiment they were doing with it or on it. And according to a former commander of the uh, Air Materiel Command at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, who on his deathbed said that uh, they were at uh, stored at the Dugway Proving Grounds, a lot, which is a lot like uh, Area 51, that the beings, the, all five of them, were uh, being stored at uh, Dugway Proving Grounds near Ogden, Utah. It's been recently speculated that uh, one of the reasons for the cover-up was that the beings were contained DNA of some sort that showed human traits, uh, homo sapiens traits. I believe the fossil record is fairly clear of our evolutionary track, where something like this uh, DNA hypothesis uh, sharing human genes of some sort uh, is, uh, you have to have more than just speculation on that. I think, you know, as far as the hybrid situation and, and monitoring what we're doing and what, what, the, what the extraterrestrials could possibly be, could they be, I mean, one conjecture was, was really incredible, was could they be us from the future? And I thought that was brilliant to say, you know, because that's what they actually thought uh, when they did this research um, in Roswell, that they thought maybe they were time travelers. They were time travelers and they were us from the future. The, the study about time compression is very interesting. For 30 years of my 31 years investigation of Roswell, I never considered where they were from, where they, the, the, the occupants of the spaceship, where they might have been from. So along about a year or two ago, I interviewed the two sons of one of the paperclip Germans who were brought over after World War II, a rocket scientist, uh, you know, Werner von Braun and his crew. Well, second in command of these paperclip uh, rocket scientists was a fellow named Ernst Steinhoff. So it was extra temporal according to Ernst Steinhoff. Well, I know they can't get here from there because the, the space uh, time continuum in, in the universe, it's too great but they had to compress the space-time continuum to 
maybe jump from one to the other without having to spend a thousand years to get here. This Navy commander, his name was George Hoover, he was on Werner von Braun's, he was in his group studying UFOs and uh, Roswell and things like that. Well, you know, Roswell was a crash of a, of a ship from somewhere else. Oh, you know, you figure, oh, well, Alpha Centauri, what, uh, Serpo, you know, what, where are you talking about? He says, no, no, no. It was not extraterrestrial, it was extra temporal. Time travelers. So when you look at the UFO phenomenon and we wonder there's some explanations of why they might be here, some hypothesis that people have made. Now when you look at it, here on Earth as humans, we, we, we tag cows, we, we, we look at different biological um, specimens under the microscope and we, and we log them, we figure out what's going on, we run tests on them, we do this kind of stuff with animals so we can learn from it. We've had aspect in thinking of the fact that it's a big possibility that that's what they're here to do with us. So just like we treat cattle and we, we tag them on their ear with a number, they could hear, be here doing the same exact thing. What do you think that implant is in somebody's body after they've had an experience with the UFO? That's the same thing that we're doing. And that's what a lot of people think here. I mean, this is pos a big possibility of what's happening here because it's not only people being abducted and, and say yours or my generation, um, this goes on generational. This is a generational thing. Um, I've talked to people that have had um, cousins and, and, and brothers and grandmothers and, and their fathers have had experiences and it runs in the family. We also talk about RH negative blood. That is a bloodline that has just popped up in the, out of nowhere within science. We have no idea. It's the only one we have no idea where it came from in life. It just appeared one time and it's been here ever since. Um, and we try to think, maybe is it a possibility that we have hybrids here? Are these the people that are being taken or having these experiences? It's a great possibility. So uh, don't just look into the one little aspect of it. Look at it all. Take the, get the bigger picture, take it in and understand what you're looking at. Then you can be intelligent enough to go and have a conversation with somebody, learn from somebody else and actually know what you're talking about. Don't take the short way out because it's good to have this information and know what's going on because it's happening. The government wouldn't be involved, like I said many times before, if it wasn't a real phenomenon. And I think for the skeptics out there that are, that are saying, oh, you know, we need definitive proof. I think the proof is there. Look at the, look at the amount of video that these people are getting. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a number that, are, that could be faked, but there's a lot of really, really compelling evidence there. Listen to people's stories. Look at their body movements. Look at the way they're emotionally talking about these events that happened in their life that they can't explain. You can't fake that kind of like that human emotion there. Um, so when I see, when I hear skeptics say, well, you know, there, there's no such thing as UFOs. There's no such thing as Bigfoot. Sorry, we've had evidence. We've seen it. I've had experiences myself. People that are, um, that are high up in society, that are classy, good people, they had these experiences that they can't explain. And uh, so what to the skeptics, I say, you know, really look at the proof. Look, there is proof there. You just have to dig deep. I was on the fence with the belief that people were getting abducted, like the, the few people that I really truly believe that were abducted, and I've interviewed them too, um, incredible, was uh, well, Kathleen Martin, whose uh, aunt uh, was Betty Hill, Betty and Barney Hill. I really truly believe that they seriously had that abduction, that happened to them. Uh, another gentleman that I talked to, Calvin Parker. He was the uh, Pascagoula UFO encounter in 1973, where him and Charlie Hickson were abducted uh, and taken aboard a UFO. And they were also examined, and the aliens that came out there 
did not look like greys. They looked like robots. And very, very strange account. And and Calvin is the most down-to-earth guy and has not wavered from the story since 1973. I found it very interesting that Abril Haynes, the director of national intelligence, the head of the entire intelligence community, and the NASA administrator, Bill Nelson, appeared together at the National Cathedral. We were discussing our future in space. And they made some very telling revelations. For example, it was the first time in my memory where a sitting head of the intelligence community of the United States spoke the word extraterrestrially in the context of these UAP craft. I believe that's an important step forward of building a bridge to actually revealing to the world and to the U.S. citizen exactly what happened at Roswell, what's happening now over our skies. So I have high hopes about the coming years as we approach the 75th anniversary of Roswell that the government will finally come clean as to what exactly is this phenomenon all about. Who are flying the craft? Where do they come from? Are they part of our hidden past that we've forgotten? Uh, can they uh, then s correlate it to, for example, religious texts that describe a creation story where gods or gods were able to create humans made in their image? I have high hopes that 2022 will be the year where we start making that first step toward revealing the actual truth. And, and one of the last things I, I, I want to discuss is disclosure. Uh, the disclosure, the question is, will we ever know? Will, will the government ever tell everything they know about the subject of UFOs? My answer to that is absolutely not. There's no way that we as a society will we'll, uh, be told everything the government know, knows or known since 1947. There's uh, numerous reasons why the government can't tell the, the truth. Number one, research and development. They're never gonna tell us everything they know about what they've learned. Number two, about alien technology, uh, human, uh, human hybrids. Has, has the ETs manipulated uh, the, the human DNA. Uh, then they're not going to talk about that. Now, will they say, yeah, we might be visited or what, what these objects you're seeing is not terrestrial? Maybe. But that generates more questions than answers. So my personal belief, and I know I, I'm contrary to some other people like Lou Elizondo, uh, is that, uh, no, I don't, I don't think we'll ever get full disclosure. Uh, this fellow from Harvard, Avi Loeb, uh, two years ago, there was a, uh, I thought it was an asteroid passing through the solar system, but he thought it was a uh, spaceship of some sort, uh, uh, but, you know, which I would, you know, say put out of my mind, except he's from Harvard. He, he's a Harvard physicist, and he, he came up with the theory that it was a uh, long trajectory uh, probe of some sort. So uh, he's created a, uh, a project called the Galileo Project, and they're, they're launching a, another, uh, is it the Webb? Uh, the Webb Telescope has is, is been launched again. They're getting an unfettered view of the universe. So they will be able to see the, the uh, uh, chemical elements of stars and planets and things like that. Plus, the, everything is clearer than what you get from a telescope down on the Earth. So I expect some, so because they're coming up with more Earth-like planets every month. They come up with another one. I forget what the total is now, but uh, this one star, 41 light years away, has seven of them, seven Earth-like planets. So, uh, uh, And the universe, there has to be, as... Uh, uh, Carl Sagan would say billions and billions of Earth-like planets. And, and uh, 
that's a, according to scientists, you have to have an Earth-like planet with water to have life. That I expect some startling announcement within the next five years along those lines. Uh, not just, uh, oh, there's so many Earth-like planets. I expect a little more definition to come within five years. Uh, certainly a report from the government soon about what they are collecting and uh, what everybody suspects uh, the UAPs really are. 200 years ago, would you people would think that we could actually see on a box, uh, we could see other people on this box in our living room uh, or talk to people from vast distances around the globe on our phones or, uh, you know, or through a telephone. That would have been absolute, like, you know, would have been witchcraft, you know, it would have been like out of the realm of people's thinking. Um, but look at where we are today. Look at the technology. So keeping an open mind, I think, is, is really, really important to, to everything that we talk about in the paranormal world. Because um, I always say that there's always a bit of truth to the folklore. Keep an open mind. We hear people all the time when they report cases say, yeah, I think I'm going crazy. I think I'm losing my mind. You know what I mean? But I saw this and I had to report it to somebody. And we tell them all the time, listen, it happens all the time. You know what I mean? People see things all the time. And most things can be explained. Don't get me wrong. We have a statistics. It's about 96, 94% of things can be explained. And there's 6% that cannot be explained. And that 6% is what makes the phenomenon real. People always say, well, how do we know this is real and not just the government technology? Well, let's look at it this way. If you look at the millions and millions of cases that have been reported to MUFON and, and other organizations, all it takes is one of them to be real for this phenomenon to be a true thing. So that's how we have to look at it on the scale. And then if you really know your astronomy and you know how big the universe is and how big the galaxy is, you'll realize that we're just a small speck in a huge, huge ocean. I expect something definitive, something startling, something solid to come from uh, the, the, the telescopes and the, the science that's behind it and hopeful that the government in their projects now that the, they're known around the world, they can't hide them anymore. They have to come out with something solid and not couched in words that uh, just turn out to be gobbledygook to, to keep the cover up going. That's what I'm hoping for is some transparency because the world is ready for it. The world is ready for it. You don't know what the future is going to hold. You, you, you Try those open doors. I firmly believe not in the need to know. I think the need to know is outdated. It's outmoded. I believe in the need to share. There's so many skeptics. There's so many people that are backstabbers against legitimate researchers within the Rioja community that the skeptics um, are, are everywhere. And so, I always say this, we have to ask the right questions. If we ask the right questions, it generates thought. And thinking by smart people will sometimes answer those questions without us going having to go through a FOIA request, which we know that the government's not going to give if they don't want to give. So one of the things that you have to do, uh, even if you're just beginning in this in the subject area of UFOs is ask the questions. Ask the right questions, do the right research, and you might get the right answers.